Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, new book today, Book of Hebrews. You know, the Israelites would always call each other Israelites. But when, when they crossed the Euphrates River, um, then the Canaanites and many others called them Eber, which from this comes Hebrew, which means those that cross the river. And the first report of it you'll find in Genesis 14, 13, where it was Abram, later to be his name to be changed to Abraham, <coughs> who would be called the Hebrew, which means simply the one that crossed the Euphrates River. This is, this is interesting to a scholar in more ways than one. A sort of an oddity because so much attention is drawn to that Euphrates even back to there and yet in prophecy in the in the book of Revelation you are told the word is used kadim which means you you don't just look east you go to the Euphrates and look east from there and you'll see your enemy You'll see the trouble. And that was for the end days, and hey, that's exactly as it is today. So that's, that's how we, we come here to, uh, what about the author? The author, of course, is Almighty God. He's the author of every book in the, um, in the Holy Word of God. But who did he use for this? He used Paul. There's, there's no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, Peter in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and uh, you will find there in about verse 15 that Paul wrote a letter to this people, the Hebrews. And if this isn't it, where is it? Because it is the letter from Paul. Paul, Paul many people say, well, it's not quite his style. Oh, yes, it is. You would show your ignorance if you didn't recognize it because his main language was Hebrew. In other words, he studied at the feet of Gamiel, and he could speak more languages, um, that is to say, than anyone. He could speak Roman, because his father was a Roman. He could speak Greek, but it was colloquial Greek, or, or you might even say street Greek. And this is how you recognize Paul's teachings, but he was educated in this language so that makes it a little bit different, but a person that is, understands the manuscripts has no problem with it whatsoever. So naturally, uh, Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, 15, gives us the credentials of Paul. And um, if, you, if you don't recognize Paul, you better throw Peter out also, because he was giving him credentials. So having said that, chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Hebrews, let's go with it. God, who at sundry times, many different times, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, all the way back to the very beginning, even in Adam, to Adam, he would speak uh, at different times, bringing a message always, a prophecy. Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, this word worlds is not cosmos or erets, meaning soil or, or a, a geographical location. It's aeon, it's times. In other words, um, he put him over all times. That means the first earth age, 
this one and the one to come. God is the same yesterday, He is today, and He will be forever. So here we have this beautiful truth of the power and the all, all encircling of, of uh, God's wishes that if you believe upon this Son, then naturally you're going to believe God because God sent Him. He would say in Isaiah 7, verse 14, a virgin will conceive, will bear a male child. You will call him Emmanuel, being interpreted. What does it mean? God with us. So he was God with us. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. Verse 3, who being, in, who be, who being the brightness of his glory, that's the Shekinah glory, and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by, when he had by himself purged out sins, sit down, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Do, do you know what he's quoting here? And, and it's important. We're going to go there. It's Psalms 110. And, and you need to absorb it. This is why he was quoting it, Psalms 110. Listen to the authority that comes forth from this. Psalms 110, and it reads, you'll have it on the screen. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That, that promise is going to stand. Our enemies will be made his footstool. They're going to get everything they got coming to them, and then some. Verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. You take charge, and he shall. 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. In other words, that freshness, that control is always there with him. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. I mean, you can, you can nail it. You can count on it. God's not going to change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, to, to understand this, you must know what the word Melchizedek means in whatever language you so choose to pick. Melcha is king. Zedek is the just, righteousness, or, or um, God's elect, whichever you want, making him king of kings and lord of lords. That high priest forever, and yet at the same time king. Verse 5, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He, our father's not happy. And that day of wrath is coming, and uh, it's not that far off. Verse 6, He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And um, he's going to break the leaders, break them back. They will, they will be brought to, to tow and brought under control on the Lord's day. We will take over on the Lord's day. That is to say, Christ shall, and we're his servants. Verse 7, to complete the chapter. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So the Nephilim, the, the fallen ones, um, he's going to do away with them. Th those are the first 7,000 you'll read of in Revelation chapter 11 that die instantly at his return. And so it is. So returning then to first, uh, the first chapter of Peter, of, of brother of Hebrews, let's pick it up with verse 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, and it reads, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name 
than they. Well, the Son of God, the only begotten, he that was promised, when God would say at Sandra's times, meaning in the beginning, let us create man in our, don't overlook the word our, image. In other words, God included himself and his image carries forth Almighty God's image through this Son. And for this reason, much better than the angels. Why? It was God with us. Verse 5, And unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, I, I can't resist it, you know, especially in the troubled times we have today of how the heathen rage. You cannot help but go back to Psalms 2. That's what he's quoting from. And, and when Almighty God quotes from um, a book, then it's, it does you well to go there and check it out. So, Psalms 2. And it reads, um, we're going to take the entire chapter, and it will say, when we get there, very important that you recognize the time and why God would quote the, from this Psalms, especially in this generation here where we're in the closing times of the end times. Listen to it carefully. Psalms 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why, why do they blow themselves up? Why do they do these strange things? Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed sayings. In other words, they, they, in every way they go against God. The, the very foundation of home life itself questioned, though God made it so very clear as to how it should be, trying to take God's very name away from the little children and then wonder why the children uh, are so um, uh, uncontrolled, un, um, how that they do as they do. Why? Because, because God has been removed from their vocabulary. Verse 3, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Get rid of them, those that will not convert. Verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision, and he shall. They will not have a prayer of a chance. That is to say, those that go against him, all that are with him and for him, I don't care of what tribe, what people, what language, then you are guaranteed his protection. But if you go the other way and act as the heathen, the infidel, then God help you because you're going to need it. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who is that king? King of kings and lord of lords. There's just one. Verse 7, I shall declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, and this is why we came here. This is where he's quoting this in that first chapter of Hebrews. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And there that scripture is fulfilled and why we're here. Let the heathen rage. We have the son. Verse 8, ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You, you take it over. It, it is, God has promised it. 
and so it is. Verse 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. And that's what Christ is coming back with. Not as a babe to be crucified, but as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he rules with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10, be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Wise up. Notice where the power comes from. Who issues it? It's from our Father and the Son. 11. Serve the Lord with fear, that's reverence, and rejoice with trembling. You can be happy in it. You can rejoice uh, having it your way. 12. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. <clears throat> and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. <clears throat> and where is your trust? Your trust had better be in him, not the heathen of the world. You know, we've, we've had so many experiences such as Bangladesh where we had heathen raging and nothing was done about it. That time is coming when somebody's going to do something about it. How precious it is. Uh, it is written, and it shall come to pass as it is written. So we return then to the sixth verse, chapter 1, the great book of Hebrews, and let's go with it. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Why? Well, Emmanuel, God with us, why wouldn't they? Verse 7, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, uh, and his ministers a flame of fire? And he's quoting here, I'm not going to go there, but it might make a good home assignment for you. It's Psalms 104. Who are those ministers of fire? God is a consuming fire, so naturally it is those that minister the truth in these troubled times. That, that ministry, that flaming fire, has the blessings of God. It always will have those blessings of God. It will, uh, nothing can stop it, for that day is approaching, and God says what he means, and he means what he says. And um, those ministers of fire, as, and it's well, it's well written in Psalms 104. It make a good home study for you. Verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, notice what he calls him, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Everything in it is right. What he does, his decisions are right. That's why you can love him so much. That's why that you can see that Shekinah glory shine from him. Because he always does what's right. He wrongs no one, but he does see that everybody gets everything they got coming to them. Sometimes that makes people think they're being picked on. Uh-uh. You earn it, you receive it. You're going to get everything you've got coming to you. If, if you have been loyal and a loving servant of Almighty God, you got blessings. If you fall in the other camp, you got trouble, and boy, are you going to get it. You can guarantee that God will keep His word. That's why He is right and righteous. And you might say, well, wouldn't he let some slip through? Are you trying to bribe him? Do you know what kind of a sin a bribe is? To try to bribe the judge? He is the judge. So repentance can cover a lot of sins when you're sincere. And it's never too late. Verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness, and hated iniquity. You hate sin. 
Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You know, this is something that many Christians overlook, is the anointing of the oil of our people. Well, what is that oil? It's, uh, it's olive. What, what is the olive tree when you pronounce it? el uh, yah That's God's title and his sacred name in that oil that is so healthy. It is, it is not the oil that performs miracles. It is your obedience to obey God and use it in praying for the sick, your home, or whatever the case may be. Anoint it. You know, you might say, well, I didn't know Christians were supposed to now. Then you show your ignorance because Christ means the anointed one. And the etymology of his name even comes from as rubbing with anointing with oil. So it's very, very important and should never, never be overlooked. Verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Not, not some big bang theory. And don't you ever listen to one of these quacks that would have you believe that, well, it was evolution caused all this to be. And do you know something? You want, do you want to hear some, uh, my opinion of evolution? And it should be yours. Because if evolution were a fact, it would have to be unending. In other words, if we all came from amoebas, as they would have you believe, you would have to still have that process in motion today of amoebas turning into this and this turning into that, and then they would stand on their feet. You would have all of these various translations transformations uh, of, of growth and evolution. But you know something? You can dig into a bank out here and pick an old shell out and what it was thousands of years ago is still there. Pick a live one today, it looks exactly the same. Why? Because that's the way God created it. So don't ever let anyone pass Evolution is building something 50 feet off the ground. It's going to crash. Okay. God created what he would have, and it is his to control and his uh, to do with as he so chooses. But know that of a fact and understand that, and if you want God's blessings, you will always follow that. Verse 11 to continue. And verse 11 reads, They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth the garment. They're not going to be around, but you're going to have eternal life. And do you know something? That word, uh, eon, that we, we uh, read in, in verse 2, it has nothing to do with your spiritual body. You do not, when you overcome and inherit eternal life, then certainly um, your garment doesn't get old. By that I mean your body is maintained for your soul and spirit eternally. Verse 12, And as a vestus shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Why? Because you have eternal life. Those that don't have it, hey, they're out of here. And you might say, well, that, that's kind of sad. No, it isn't. If somebody's going to be trouble, and if somebody isn't intelligent enough to see the very graciousness of God, His righteousness, and in loving him and following him, wh what it brings you in inheriting eternal life. If, if you're a troublemaker, you're not going to be in heaven because we're not going to have any trouble there. 
Well, how does God eliminate it then? He eliminates the troublemakers. They go into that um, they're blotted out. They don't exist. But you have that beautiful eternal body that never grows old and never has illness, but has eternal life with Almighty God. Verse 13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And again, he's quoting that Psalms 110 again. That's why it's so important. He didn't. We know one that tried to take that seat. And you can read of it in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. It was Tyrus, which is to say the false rock, which is to say none other than Satan himself. <clears throat> he wanted to take that, he wanted to take that seat, but it was denied, and he will never even get close. But the Messiah connotation being Messiah shall sit there. It is his throne, and it is his throne forever. Verse 14 to complete the chapter. Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And, of course, uh, that's it, that is as it is. The very Word of God. What, what is ministering spirits? That is to say, when you receive the truth, you can't help ministering it. That means to pass it on. That means to share it. There, there is no way that anyone can prevent you. If you're an heir of that salvation and, and uh, someone asks, you're going to minister that eternal life. Uh, you're going to tell them how they can acquire it, where it comes from. It comes from our Father Himself. It's His promise. And He always keeps His word. His word is solid. His word is secure. His word is not as the word of men. You can count on it. You will find no flaw in it when you look properly. It is complete within itself. It is man that has flaws and those you have to correct in, in your very life itself. Chapter 2, verse 1. Let's go a few verses here. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. In other words, you need to pay strict attention to the Word of God. As you've covered it, as you've read it, you can't remember the whole thing, of course. <clears throat> but at least don't let it slip. The main part you can remember. It's imbued into your mind, the, the, the presence of the very Holy Spirit and the gift of God, which is to say eternal life. You cannot let that slip away. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, of reward if they get fair payment. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. In other words, it was ministered. It was passed on. Don't ever let it slip. It's steadfast. It's solid. It's something you can really base your life upon and, and have a, a little sanity about you in a very troubled, mixed-up world. You can have that solidity of spirit, knowing God touches you. God leads you and God directs you and brings you to the very throne of God, God ultimately. How precious it is 
to be a servant of his and to pass that good news on. Well, what, what was that good news? The eternal life, salvation. That means saved from this mixed up heathenistic world into the beautiful life eternally chosen by God himself as a blessing and a, and a fair gift to those that do what is right. That gift is yours. It's there for the taking. Let him know that you love him. That's what pays the dividends. Next verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. God's will is something you want to be sure and follow. When you pray for something, pray, God, if it be your will. Why? If he loves you and you're in good standing, he's not going to give you something that can bring hurt on you or your family. That's why you always want to pray in his will. Many men think that shows a sign of weakness. It doesn't. It's strength to know that you love him enough that if he doesn't want you to have it, you don't want it, regardless of what your desires may be, because you want to be an able servant. You want to be a loving child of the living God, one that he, he can be so very happy with, because he created you to bring himself pleasure. You might say, well, would you document that? The last verse of chapter 4, the great book of Revelation, all things were created for his pleasure. You give him no pleasure, and you're in a heap of hurt. That is what serving him is, is really about. But most of all is receiving his love and understanding and blessings whereby that you are well taken care of by the hand of the living God. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular denomination, reverend, or organization. Why? We're not going to judge people. We have a judge. That's our Father. He doesn't need your competition. Do you know, he, he feels he's quite capable of taking care of that himself. But you do have the right for spiritual discernment to know right from wrong. So always hang in with that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, Got a prayer request, you don't need that number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. Let him know that you love him. That's what he wants most from you. It's written in Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, that's your mercy, your love. You do that and you receive his blessings. Father, 
around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, James from Indiana. Uh, was or is Jesus Jewish? No, he, he is of the tribe of Judah, half, and of the tribe of Levi, half. Well, why would he be that way, and how can you document it? Well, <clears throat> Mary's cousin Elizabeth was a full-blood Levite, married to a Levite priest, meaning Mary's mother that enabled her to be a cousin of Elizabeth herself was a Levite. But her husband, Heliol, as you'll read in Luke 3, was of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, you have the king line and the priest line joined in one. And that was the genealogy being the son of God of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your teaching. You are welcome. Kathy from uh, Georgia. When someone is buried, why do they always face them toward the eastern sky? Well, uh, you, let, let, let's clarify one thing. When one is buried, it is customary, but the way a pastor knows who, his place, which is, is at the head of the deceased. Well, how do you know where the head is? It will always be on the west end facing upright, meaning looking toward the east at the morning sun. It, it, is, it is just a custom, and it really means not that much. Because to a student of God's Word, we know from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse uh, 6 and 5 and 6, 7 rather, that when, when the silver cord parts, when you die, Instantly, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, and it dwells in whichever body you're in, the spiritual body or flesh body. Well, your flesh body is dead, so it moves into your spiritual body and returns to the Father from whence it came. So they're not out there in the ground, a hole in the ground. Only the remains are there. So really, it's just a custom. Be that as it may, nothing wrong with it, but uh, so it is. Lisa from South Carolina. My husband has been married before and has not asked for forgiveness. I have not been married before. Does that mean that our children is cursed? I really appreciate uh, the teachings. Well, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, you know, I, see, you put me in a position you want me to judge. I don't know whether your husband has repented or not. Many, maybe you don't either. God does. But your children, by 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as long as he does not prevent you from teaching them Christ, then um, you have every right to be with him, for maybe you will even convert him if he is not a Christian. Or if he is a Christian, then that's God's business. So, but whatever. The sins of the Father do not fall on the Son. So don't, don't try to say that God would punish some little old child for what its parents did. I, I realize there are diseases today that may carry over, but sin itself is not going to be accounted by God to the child. Charlie from Kentucky um, you're so, thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, I thank God for all of you. It's the only good truth that I have been taught about the Bible. Well, well, bless you. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we'll get it done for you. My question is, I would like to know, what does the only begotten one mean? It means that Jesus Christ, Mother Mary, was the only virgin that ever conceived by the Holy Spirit and brought forth God's promise from the very beginning 
let us create man in our image. And that boy was in the very image of Almighty God himself. Further documentation you'll find in St. Uh, uh, John chapter 14 when Christ would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so it is. Why? Because he was the Father with us. Uh, Dorina from California. Is it okay to constantly ask God for his grace and his Holy Spirit to fill us up and to feel his peace within us like uh, multiple times daily asking? It, as, multiple times is fine. The main thing is, is don't turn it into a chant. This is, God does not appreciate chants. Well, why would he not appreciate a chant? Well, you get the flesh into it, okay? The, the flesh gets very involved in a chant, and that's not you yourself speaking to him. So therefore, he doesn't like that. But as far as you asking more than one time a day, it isn't necessary. All you have to do is ask him once in that day and through the Holy Spirit, he'll grant it. But if it makes you feel better, you go ahead. That's communicating with him. Uh, many of us communicate with him many times a day in asking guidance and asking assistance to understand Scripture, to know a deeper meaning or what the meaning truly is. That's, that's communicating with our Father through Spirit. Okay, Lynn from Indiana. If the moon is of Satan, is it okay for me to still enjoy the moon? The moon is not of Satan or from Satan. In mythology, Saturn is known as Satan's planet. Okay, That's where the word Saturday comes from. That, that is Satan's day, his planet. And... Um, uh, it is scriptural, and you've heard me teach sermons on it. But as far as the moon is concerned, um, Satan has no power over the moon. It reflects the sun and gives us light at, in the dark night uh, when, when uh, it is its time. But uh, Saturn, from scripture, is... Um, is represents evil. Uh, Gag Gagmar from California. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it talks about the God of this world. Is that Satan? Absolutely. God allowed him to have the power as God of this world, meaning the, the, the events that transpire in this world. This is why that in Matthew 4, he could offer it to Christ if Christ would worship him. But it's his. That's to say the negative, you might, might say for clarity, the negative part of this world belongs to him. Because it is that that would lead you astray, that that would mislead you. It's, it's his world, and he's going to do it. You see, when... when some, when some group tries to take God away, his name away, they're of Satan. Okay. That's Satan work, working double time. And you might as well recognize it and realize they're damned unless they change their way. Uh, but those that strive to bring the word forth then certainly um, uh, that's as it is. But this world uh, belongs right now, the, the wickedness of it, the evilness of it, the raging of the heathen. Um, that's uh, strictly from Satan himself. Uh, Tommy from Alabama, which Bible do you recommend? Well, naturally, I recommend the Companion Bible if you want to really study God's Word. Number one, there are 198 appendix 
in the back of that Bible that has more biblical knowledge than most people, a lot of people will ever have an opportunity to attain. It, it really gives you a lot of good help. And, but there are many works. The main thing I do recommend is whatever you do, stick with the original King James as best you can and the Strong's Concordance whereby you can document whether a man is telling you the truth or not in all of the languages, whether it be Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. It is all brought out quite well for you. And that gives you a pretty good uh, double check to keep God's Word clean, pure, and honest. And if it wasn't, if you didn't have that ability, then you would have to take some man's word for it. And that's not that good an idea. Doris from Florida, what is the Holy Spirit? Can, and how do you know when you have received the Holy Spirit? I think I understand, but I want to be sure. I've studied with you since the year 2000. Thank you, Pastor Murray, and God bless. You are so welcome. But what, what is the Holy Spirit? It's God's Spirit. There's, there's no other Holy Spirit other than His. And it is His Spirit. And when it is upon you, how do you know it? When you love Him? He promises it will come to you. When you receive it, uh, He promises you that He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And, and when He promised it, He meant it. It's guaranteed. And you can certainly count on it. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's the Spirit of the Father and the Son, which is the same. Okay. Uh, Catherine from Louisiana. When we die, we go to heaven or hell. What happens on Judgment Day? Well, it's according to uh, the, let me say, you do not, when you die, go to hell. Okay. There, why? Because hell doesn't even exist at this time. Um, hell is used in the manuscripts. If you check it out, suel in the Hebrew, it's grave. They're in the grave. Hell doesn't exist until after the great white throne judgment. God doesn't send people to hell before they're judged. This is why the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16 documents there is a paradise. One side of it's good, the other side not so good because they didn't make it. And they're going to be judged because of that. So. What happens on Judgment Day, I would never pretend to even be able to answer that because God says, I want to do the judging and you stay out of it. Okay. But all you can do is teach, do what's right, and you will receive blessings. It is true that you must um, spiritually discern. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you have that ability. It's a gift from God to know, I mean, you can immediately tell there's something wrong with that. And then you know how to fix it. The Holy Spirit will guide you through it until you make the correction. But it is not our business to judge what happens on Judgment Day. Naturally, what does happen is God does His judgment. But know this. The Lord's Day will transpire before Judgment Day. And people go to paradise and they will be a thousand years in the millennium in spiritual bodies. And there will be teaching as Revelation chapter 20 verse 5 so stipulates because we are priests with Christ for the thousand years. What do priests do? They teach. They, they uh, pro uh, hopefully prosper the Word of God, pass it on, um, and minister it, whereby people are blessed from it. 
And um, then comes the great white, at the end of that thousand year period, comes the great white throne judgment. And what follows it, immediately following it, is the second resurrection, but most of all, the second death. The second death is death of the soul. That's not good. Joseph from California, if you have been, if you have been doing good, will the Lord forgive you? I have been sober for five years now. Well, you're doing real good. That's, that is great. I'm real proud for you. That's, that's, um, and, and God will forgive. All you have to do, you need to repent though, which I'm sure you have because he has strengthened you to make it this five years. That makes you a blessing to the rest of us that we see yet yeah, that you can overcome. In his name, you can overcome even easier as you have done. So uh, you've been, you're doing real good. And our Father loves you for that. You can count on it. Kevin from California. In, in Ezekiel, concerning those discs, is that the same as the UFOs? Uh, UFO means an unidentified flying object. To God, those were not unidentified. They were flying objects, all right. His, his uh, ark was even, uh, altar was even a board, one of them. And um, there's, understand, if God created this whole earth, and as God stated in Job chapter 40, I placed all the planets out in orbit where they are. I put them there. I know exactly where they are. I've got them right where I want them. And uh, if he can do that, he can certainly have a vehicle that is capable of doing what Ezekiel described. But it's not unidentified. And it certainly has a different power plant than burning fossil fuel. It's awesome, no doubt. Uh, Donald from Tennessee. Is it a sin to get cremated or do we need our whole body? You're, when your body dies, you're through with it. There is no sin in being cremated. Uh, again, I, I'll go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 6 and 7. This body goes back to dirt from which it came. Everything you have eaten or taken into your body is organic, meaning it came from the dirt. It, it was growing by nature in an organic form, and naturally it deteriorates back to dust or dirt from which it came. But your, your spiritual body is eternal. It, it doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, it doesn't wrinkle. It, time means nothing to it. It, it is eternal. So uh, there's nothing wrong with cremation. Uh, it, it is very expensive nowadays uh, to have funerals for some people that are not um, uh, in a position. Don't go in debt over your head for a box. You know, there's nothing wrong with cremation because they're already with the Father anyway. And he's probably said, my good and faithful servant, well done. And, and what you're doing is maybe putting your family in debt to see that they have a nice service. And it would have been much nicer to let the body be turned back to ashes, to, to, to dust, and, and for they are with the Father already. Leroy from Maryland. Did Adam make the ultimate sin for him not to be forgiven? Thank you. No, no, he didn't. It, again, I, I wouldn't want to judge, but uh, the, there's only one unpardonable sin, and Adam didn't commit it. Okay. The only unpardonable sin is for one of God's elect, that's somebody that knows better, that knows Satan's coming first that knows we are supposed to stand against him. If someone gives in to him and refuses the Holy Spirit to be able to speak through you, 
that's unpardonable. But I know that's not going to happen. God's elect are ready to go. They're, they say bring it on. And uh, not premeditating, but they're ready for action. Max from North Carolina. Did God create people before Adam and Eve? Yes, he did. He created all of the races. That's why we have more races than one. And he looked on the last verse of, uh, of Genesis chapter 1, and it was good. He loves all people. He loves all the races. When they obey him, when they follow him, and when they take his lead. So there's, um, that, that, that's our Father's way. That's why he created them that way. He expects them, that's the way he wanted them, and he expects them to stay that way. Pauline from West Virginia, is it okay to have a picture of Christ in your home? You know, an idol is something you worship. And certainly you're not going to worship a picture of Christ. So therefore, there's no problem with having a picture uh, to, to bring memory of him. But uh, you worship the Holy Spirit in Christ in that way, not a picture. So there you go. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes His day when you study His Word and the, the letter that He has sent you to improve your life, to give you a better standing. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.